just going to put my head down on my desk, take a nap. You folks do pretty much whatever you want. Don't steal any equipment and don't hurt anyone. Don't get campus security over here. All right? We'll see you Wednesday with our regularly scheduled class. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> uh, as you know, it is um, somewhat getting down to crunch time. We have approximately um, three more weeks of classes and then finals week. Um, I do like to devote the last class to sort of a, a review for the final and so on. And as such, um, that gives us uh, two and a half weeks or five more sessions. And again, it's always hard deciding what to do and what not to do. Uh, I've come up with the last assignment and I'd like to take a few minutes to review that with you um, while, um, uh, before we begin and, and before we talk about sort of our next topic. Um, this next assignment sort of has some extra credit potential built into it. I've, I've listed what I would like you to do for it and it's probably a little more challenging than uh, a typical assignment. But again, this is the last assignment, so you have several weeks to work on it. But in addition to the, sort of the core functionality, there is uh, a couple of options that if you do, um, you, you'll get extra points for, provided you do it correctly. Um, there are also, um, there's also one option that I didn't list that I probably would be willing to, to entertain, and, and we'll talk about that in a minute. First of all, one thing, the deadline for getting full credit on the extra credit is today. If you turn it in after the deadline, you'll get something less than full credit, assuming that it's perfect. Um, I did have to enter one point uh, for that assignment, otherwise it won't let me enter a score for anyone. So I wanted to set it up as being worth zero possible points and uh, I had to put in as one possible point. And, and therefore, um, you know, um, don't worry about it though. It's not like it's adding to the possible points. It won't count towards the possible points for your final grade. So all five extra credit points that you, you potentially get for that is, uh, um, will be extra credit. Alright, let's look at the last assignment. In the last assignment, I provided some class files for, and we can take a look at them. <coughs> Again, you can disregard the files that start with underscore as well as one labeled Mac OS. OSX. For some reason those files exist on the Mac but aren't really visible on the Mac but they do go if you transfer it over to a Windows system. Let's bring this up. The assignment is to, to make a little application that keeps track of someone's uh, account, you know, savings account. Uh, with a savings account, there can be two kinds of transactions, or three kinds of transactions actually. A deposit, a withdrawal, and a adjustment. All right. You should be able to enter these things in and show a list of the transactions as well as the current balance. Let me show you how this should act, and then we'll talk a little bit more details about it. All right, there's my screen. Your, your GUI doesn't have to be anything fancy. It just, just needs to work. What I have is I have radio buttons uh, for the three kinds of transactions, deposit, withdrawal, or miscellaneous, you know, an adjustment. If you put in a dollar amount, you can put in a description, you know. 
When you click save, what that should do is it should put down here a timestamp of when you've done it, which you know is the current date and time, um, the amount, and the fact that it's a deposit, and the fact that it is you know the, the whatever comments I had. Now there should be error trapping, and if you don't put something in again, it should give you some sort of message. It shouldn't. It, it doesn't necessarily have to be anything elegant, but it should give you some message. Uh, or if I put in a nonsensical value, it uh, should complain. Now, deposits and withdrawals can only be entered as positive numbers. So I can't enter in a negative $100 deposit. All right. Nor can I enter a negative $100 withdrawal. I can enter a $20 withdrawal and the class is smart enough to know that a withdrawal is considered to be a negative as far as your account goes to deduct it. So it can show it as a negative. It should show it as a negative like that, but it should be entered as a positive. Adjustments or miscellaneous can be either way, right? Because you could be adjusting it up or you could be adjusting it down. You know, if I made an error, that was supposed to be an $80 deposit and um, I entered it as a $100 deposit, I'd want to put in a negative $20 you know, correct deposit amount. So I either want to be able to um, enter in a positive or a negative for uh, a miscellaneous. Um, notice that in the middle of the screen there is um, the balance. You know, $100 deposit, uh, a withdrawal of $20, and a negative $20 adjustment gives me a balance of sixty dollars which is you know just numerically adding them up that's the basic functionality the basic minimal functionality uh, that I want all right let's go back to the word document dollar amounts for deposit and withdrawals must be uh, entered as positive I would suggest you create an inheritance structure for the transactions in other words yes sure No, no. What I'm saying is, is internally in your class, a deposit will always be positive. It's, if it's negative, you reject it and you don't allow them to enter it. If they enter in a, a, a withdrawal of $20, internal to your class, it might be stored as negative 20. But the GUI should only allow the enter of, entry of a positive number for a withdrawal. Now process it. Say, yeah, that that's wrong. Don't process it. Right. That's what I mean by flipping the sign. In, uh, in other words, the GUI, to the GUI you enter in a, a, a positive amount for deposits and withdrawals. Internally to your class you may, you know, you may flip the sign for a withdrawal to, to give it a negative sign. All right. I suggest you create some sort of inheritance structure and I would be happy to review it with you before you start coding. The transaction date should be a date stamp of when uh, the object was created. And transactions should display in the reverse order. So notice the newest are on the top, older, older, older. So the top is the newest going down to the oldest transaction. There's a few things that we haven't explicitly covered in class. And I know that, um, but we've probably covered enough stuff that you can sort of figure out how it goes. Um, again, in this class or really any other class, we can't possibly cover everything that you're liable to encounter. All right, um, and therefore it's good for you to take what you've applied or what you've what we what we've talked about, what you've learned in one area, and apply it maybe to a new set of classes. For example, we haven't talked about how to make a radio button work. All right. But you know what? A little poking around on the web looking for examples or in the book uh, looking for examples and documentations, you'll figure out how to do a radio button. If you really, really, really get stuck and if you've tried, let me know and we can, we can review it. Likewise, there's a button group. All right, That should give you some hint about how to make a radio button work. The fact that there's two classes, a radio button and a radio button group. All right. 
There is something called a J scroll pane. In other words, I'm not going to enter enough transactions, but the transactions, you know, the transaction, I guess I will, the transactions fill up that window, you get a little scroll bar on them at some point. I swear you do. There we go. So notice you can you can scroll and see all of them once you've filled up how much space it has allocated for it. Also decimal format, which we may have talked about in class. I'm not sure. You, you also, uh, the only thing I don't have mentioned here is being able to pull the date. All right, you, you need to be able to grab the current system date and, and store it as an attribute in, in there. So that's sort of the basic functionality. Um, six points to do just that. You then have a few extra credit options that you can, you can add on to it if you want. First extra credit option will be to add serialization to it. All right, what do I mean by that? In other words, the example I gave you does have serialization added to it. So all I need to do is, boom, close it. When I open it again, it's back to where it was. So it remembered the state of that object, my, uh, my account object. And it redisplayed that and, and it redisplayed all the transactions. Yes? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's it, in the, using the terminology we used last time, it's serializing it. Um, that, that effectively is saving the object and all its attributes. And if you look close, you can see acct.ser. That's where it saves that information. Is it doing it when you close the application down or after it returns? Well, given that I'm in an ornery mood, um, It'll do it when it, it, do, it does it when it needs to. When you th well, well, okay, I'm a nicer guy than that. All right. When do you suppose it would need to? Well, from the last lecture, I would think it would do. Okay, that's a possibility. Other thoughts? How would you want it to work? Forget about like what what you know or don't know. Ashley, how would you want it to? Work? Yeah. Yeah, I would want it so as soon as I process a transaction, uh, if the computer would happen to crash, then it, then it would have saved it. So that's kind of what I would want. So that, that's, that's how it should do it. I would also say if you do it this way, the challenge is to not store the balance anywhere, but rather calculate the balance. All right? Calculate the balance. That, believe it or not, um, especially in the long run, will make your life earlier, uh, earlier, easier. Maybe it'll make it earlier too, I don't know. Although that doesn't sound like a good thing, make your life earlier. Make your life easier. What do I mean by that? You're storing all the transactions anyhow. That's a requirement. You have to do that. If you also are storing the balance, you then have the balance stored two different ways, right? You have your balance stored as an attribute of your account. You also have your balance that's sort of implicitly stored as the list of all the transactions. In other words, your balance really is just the sum of all those transactions. So there's always a risk that you know, it, it'll, it'll be inconsistent, right? Something stored in two places always runs the risk of, of being inconsistent. So if you don't store the balance anywhere, if you just store all the transactions, it may be right, it may be wrong, but it's never going to be inconsistent, right? Uh, and therefore, that's something you never have to worry about. If, if your computer crashed and a, and a transaction wasn't processed, you go and reprocess it and your balance is taken care of. But if your computer crashed, let's say, 
immediately after saving the transaction, but before something was updated, you would run the potential risk anyhow of, of having those inconsistent. All right? At least you have that possibility. I'm not saying it would happen. I guess it depends on how you write the code. So that's the first way you can earn extra credit, is to serialize this object. Uh, so when you reopen it, you get back the list of transactions and you get back the list, uh, or you get back the balance. All right, that's, that's one extra credit opportunity. Packages and create a jar file. All right, you might not know what that means. That's one of our next topics. All right, sort of our next topics. Your last opportunity is to convert your application into a Java applet. And, and again, you may or may not be familiar with Java applets. And um, if you convert it into a Java applet, um, then, then you get a couple extra credit points. Do note, though, because the security considerations within a Java applet, the serialization won't work. All right? So you can, like, remove that code if you want. Um, all right, so I would say the main project and serialization, we've talked enough about it that you could potentially do that now, all right? The jar file and the conversion to an applet are two topics we haven't talked about yet, and that's what we'll talk about over the next uh, few classes. All right. I do sometimes give an assignment um, if you if you use a GUI, uh, if you use a, a, a IDE, um, such as Eclipse or NetBeans or something like that. I, I have in the past had assignments uh, concerning that. I decided not to make that an assignment because, again, we're getting close to the end here, and I really want to make sure we wrap up the important things. If you did use a IDE, such as NetBeans or Eclipse, I would consider giving an extra point or two. You just document the fact that you used it somehow. All right. Um, in this class, again, philosophically, uh, I, I kind of made this more of like a throwback class where we code everything command line and, and all that, uh, back like they did it in the good old days. Uh, and I've avoided IDEs. I really think it's important to do that so that you really understand the basic stuff. That being said, when you get to doing things like creating your own GUIs in, in Windows, uh, using an IDE can be really nice, all right? And it can really make, make for better looking and all that. And, and plus it is good to know it, you know? It's a case of once you, once you know the basics, then you can understand a tool and, and you're not at the mercy of the tool, all right? And, and, and you can use it effectively. All right. Any questions on that assignment? That's the last assignment. Um, and what we will be going over between now and then uh, all can sort of fit into the category of issues of deployment. All right, yes? Um, let's see. I think I put a due date on it. I think it's due, I think it's due Wednesday, right? No, I'm just kidding. Oh, I did not put a due date on it. My mistake. Um, well, let's make it do 426, which I think actually is a Thursday, but you can have the extra day if you want. That's the date I intended to put on it. I guess I, guess I forgot. All right. Deployment. What does it mean when I talk about deploying an application? I mean, you could probably figure out, just probably have heard the use of the word in other contexts. What does it mean when, when I deploy an application? Yes? Putting it out into the world. Yeah, putting it out so other people can use. Putting it out so people can use it. All right? Now, there's a variety of ways to deploy a Java application. And I want to I talk about them first in sort of uh, vaguer conceptual kind of terms. And then we'll, we'll zero in and talk about each of them at least in a bit more specifically. All right? Um, in general, if we're going to make general generalizations, let's consider this. And I 
I'm going to draw a diagram that's going to look an awful lot like the internet. But it, it's, it doesn't have to be an internet. It could be some sort of internal network or something like that. But again, um, we'll, we'll, we'll draw it. And again, it, it's only natural, especially for me, given the courses I teach and all that, to see this as being the internet. But conceivably, it could be other things as well. All right. In our little diagram here, what we have is this. We have... A client that is, I already messed it up, that is hooked through a network, probably the internet, to a server. I mean, this is a diagram I draw and show in all my classes. Well, because, again, there's a lot of common ground between all these different ideas. Now, when I talk about a client, I'm, I'm talking about someone's machine that's doing a job. That's, that's your, your rank and file members of your organization that are doing some sort of job. All right? Could be doing payroll, accounts payable, could be doing any number of things. All right, that's the client. That's the, actually the people in the trenches that are, are doing the work. Now, when I talk about the server, I talk about um, a, a system that responds to requests. All right, it's important to keep that in mind that, that sometimes people talk about a server as being like, like hardware. And, and of course, server includes hardware, but a server really is a computer that's working in a certain role. It's the role that it's in more than the physical hardware that makes it a server, in other words. And, and a server responds to requests. A client makes requests. Now, let's think about this uh, a, a little bit. And when it comes to deployment, there are really, in very broad, general terms, there are three options, all right? And we'll talk about those options again very conceptually, then we'll get down to, to actually talking about the details of them. So my, my goal here is talking about installing a Java program so that clients can use it. One possibility is a deployment completely on the client side. All right. This would be like, you know, buying a piece of software and popping it in your in your CD drive and and running the install and it copies all the files onto your machine, all right? And then you're good to go, like installing Microsoft Office, especially older versions and and so on and so forth. All right. That's sort of the standard way that in the past software has been uh, deployed, right? You have some sort of media that contains it. Now, maybe you download that media from the server. That's maybe the only way the server gets involved there. But generally speaking, the, everything happens on the client side. All right? That's one option. When I say everything, everything as far as the installation of, of code happens on the client side. It is possible, again, the server could be used for other resources. For example, it may, the, this application may talk to a database server that is elsewhere. Another way that you can have it conceptually is the deployment is completely on the server. In other words, the application lives on the server. All right? Can anyone give an example of this? Not necessarily of Java, but some other case. If Microsoft Word would be, would correspond to this, what would correspond to that? Correspond to an application that lives out in the server somewhere. Google Docs, perfect, right? What do you, have any of you used Google Docs? No? You should, if nothing else, just see how it works, right? But Google Docs effectively is a word processor that you run through your browser. 
Um, let me go in. Nothing up my sleeve, as they say. Let me log in. Oops. And when you go in, I can go and I can pick up one of my files. open it in a window and away I go getting an error alright there we go alright here's my word processing document with the stuff that I want to cover in this class this has a very old version of IE. That's why I'm getting these stupid errors. And I can go in and I can edit this if I want. Yeah. Let's try opening Firefox with this. Alright, so let me go and call up, probably not the same doc, yeah, that's the one I did. Alright, here's the stuff I plan on talking about, and again, I can go over and do anything I could do with a regular word processor. Well, I won't say do everything I can do, because this does have a limited, limited uh, functionality, but I can do a lot of the things I can do. And I can do the most basic things I can do, right? Um, Microsoft Word has a, a bazillion different features, and you can quote me on that, right? Of which most people use maybe 1% of, maybe a very small percentage of, right? For example, these are my lecture notes. My lecture notes, am I ever going to want to, you know, wrap text around an image or whatever? Probably not. I don't need all that. I don't need a table of contents. I don't need footnotes. I don't need a lot of things. So again, yeah, if you're making something really extensive that, but if you're doing just lecture notes, yeah, I can type them in here. I can do a little bit of formatting, so it's not just a plain old text editor, so I can go and, for example, um, make, make font a little bit bigger if I want to. Bold, underline, italics, all right. I can do all those basic things. I can make lists if I want to and so on down the line. All right. Now, you'll note, what did I do to install Google Docs? Absolutely nothing. All right. Why? Because the application doesn't live on my machine. All right. The application lives on Google servers. All right. In fact, more than the application lives on the Google servers, right? my data actually lives on the Google servers. Now, to be sure, I can import and I can export and all that, but the main data for this uh, resides on their servers. So therefore, there's no installation process because there's nothing to install. The application lives there. What do I need to access it? I simply need a good enough web browser to access it, of which apparently the version of IE I was running wasn't one, but if I upgrade it or if I use Google Chrome, as they suggested, then I wouldn't have that problem. So. This is sort of the second alternative. The application is deployed on the server, and then the client is what is called, they used to call it this, I don't know if they call it the, quite this much so more, they call this a thin client. Thin meaning not a lot of, re, not, not extensive requirements uh, 
for it to work. In other words, if I'm installing an application, all right, look at it this way. If I'm installing an application and I have a very powerful machine, uh, Microsoft Word will run at a certain speed. If I have a less powerful machine, Microsoft Word probably won't run quite as fast. All right. Imagine if I have a less powerful machine in this scenario where the application lives on a server somewhere. It's probably not necessarily the speed of my machine that matters. It's the speed of my internet connection. So if I have a fast internet connection, it doesn't matter if I'm running a netbook, right? It doesn't have to be that powerful of a machine. I could be accessing it via my phone. It doesn't matter. As long as I have uh, what's, the, the, what's necessary, if, you know, I have the, what, if I meet whatever the thin client requirements are, in this case a browser, I'm good to go. All right? So, that's sort of the second option. Everything happens on the server. There's a very thin client that the user interacts with. Typically, again, in, in modern times, <laughs> you know, that would be a web browser. Then sort of the third option is sort of a mix. Some things on the client, some on the server. And again, there's all different kinds of variations of this one, right? It could be that the application lives here, but the database lives there. So you're splitting some of the work. It could be that you're talking about uh, a Java applet, which we'll talk about what a Java applet is um, shortly. And it could be um, what is called, um, excuse me, um, a, what's called a Java web start, where you use uh, a browser to start on the client a, uh, a, a, you use a server to download and start from a browser an application running on the client. All right. That's sort of the three general options. What do you suppose the respective advantages and disadvantages of these are? All right. And when we talk about advantages and disadvantages, let's talk about these two extreme cases. Because the middle case, you know, guess what? As some of the advantages of each and some of the disadvantages of each. So it's just like a lesser degree of both of them. All right. So let's talk about the advantages versus disadvantages of client deployment versus deployment on the server. Does anyone care to list an advantage or disadvantage of one or the other? How so? Well, if you have all of your information on the client, then they can get at it because it's right on the computer. Whereas if you have it on the server, they would have to make it into the server in order to get at it. Okay. That's an interesting, that's an interesting observation. All right. Because when you said security, I thought you meant something else. And we'll come back to that uh, something else um, in, a, in a minute. Um, how, how can I, let, let, me, let me try how to, to phrase, phrase that. Um, um, client could be more vulnerable to physical access. All right. In other words, you could go and sit at someone's computer when they were away at lunch, right? And you could potentially access data that you're not supposed to uh, be able to access. You know, whereas a, a server typically servers are are housed in a much more secure environment than that. So. Yeah, that, that's one. Can anyone think of other security kind of issues? Yes? Well, I was kind of thinking of it from the opposite. Right. right. That I'm not sure I want to put my documents on Google Docs. Okay. I don't know who's going to. Okay. You know, yeah, that's true. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
if my laptop gets stolen, then people have my data, right? So it's easier to, to you know, it, or it's harder to physically secure a client, all right? But when you think of web-based applications, the problem with those uh, is that you don't physically need to be there. In fact, that's a selling point, right? I access this Google Doc from this workstation here. I can access them in lab. I can access them there. Well, guess what? If someone hacks my account, they can do that too. All right? They can go and they can find that. So um, I'll say this is more vulnerable to virtual access, if that's, and you know what I mean, through hacking accounts, etc. So, we could probably debate this either way, right? Which is a more secure? The point is, is both of them have security issues that you're going to want to make some steps, take some steps to deal with, all right? In one case, you know, you're physically vulnerable. That is, if someone steals that, you know, they have your, your stuff. In the other case, it's sort of logically vulnerable. Yes? So, well, deployment is easier if you're rolling out to just one server as opposed to rolling out <laughs> of PC. Absolutely. Has anyone ever worked in an environment where they've had to, like, roll out a, a software upgrade to many people out in the field? All right. Let me not jot that down. Then, let me tell you know, this is where, you know, I kick my feet up and say, well, let me tell you a story, all right? Uh, I worked for a, a company that made a lot of manufacturing equipment. I guess that's probably the best way to call it. They were involved in creating. Uh, equipment that was used in, in a lot of different manufacturing uh, uh, procedures and processes. And they sold their stuff all over, the, all over the world, right? And they had field engineers that worked all over the world, right? And the field engineers were responsible for, if someone called and said, I have a problem with machine XYZ, they went in, they looked at that machine XYZ, they found out what the problem was, they documented it, and then their time got billed, and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, we created, uh, the team I was on created an application for, their, for the field service engineers to, to um, pull their work orders for the day. In other words, gee, where do I have to go today? You know, they don't know, you know, it's not like they're making regular calls to these places. When, when there's a problem, that, you know, the company would call in, it would get assigned to a field service engineer, and the field service engineer would go and work on it, schedule it with the with the, the company or whatever. But they would use this application to download their work orders, and then they'd look at those work orders and figure out how to work on it. Um, the work orders also came with information about what kind of machinery they had and any notes from previous visits. You know that way, you know um, if they said, "Gee, this this." Uh, this, uh, this machine is, is stamping things, you know, twice as big as they're supposed to be. You know, the field service engineer could look and say, oh, you know what, they had that problem last May and the problem was a loose belt or something. Who knows, you know, something along those lines. So along with the work orders came sort of a history of, of that customer uh, to see like what, they, what they've done and the issues that they've run into and what kind of machines they had, just to sort of give some background and some context to, to give the field service engineer uh, a chance to, to fix it. So the field service engineer goes in into the field and they go and they, they first of all check to make sure that the machines they're supposed to have that they have, right, because sometimes that could be you know, there could be mistakes or whatever, or maybe they retired a machine or whatever. All right, so they update that. They update uh, what their fix was so that the next guy that comes around knows that, gee, you know, when it stamps things twice as big as it should be, you know, the belt was too loose or whatever. And then finally it, it hit the billing system to say, I worked X amount of time on this and, you know, and it was not under warranty and blah, blah, blah. So our billing, their billing department could take care of it and send the proper bills. All right. 
So let me let me establish what was um, uh, relevant in, in this scenario. What was relevant in this scenario is this: these field service engineers didn't necessarily work out of a home office, right? Because they're traveling around a certain geographical area, and they may be going to, for example, Detroit today. Uh, Toledo tomorrow. So it's not like they have a home office to go into. They do stop at their home office sometime, but they're sort of on the road an awful lot, like, like, like a sales rep might be, you know, where there is a home office, but they, they do a lot of their work out on the road. So therefore, for them to bring their laptops in is, you know, to home office is dicey, all right? The other thing is that some of these folks at the time, anyhow, were going to places where internet connections were not that great, right? You know, where they, it would be difficult to, to go and connect to a site and you're in a manufacturing facility that could be dusty and dirty and no wireless and so on and so on. And therefore, it would be difficult to do that. So what we would do is we would send CDs around to these engineers. Well, number one, it was hard getting a CD to the engineer, right? Because you don't know where this guy is. This guy, by the nature of his job, travels and he's around a lot. So maybe we send it to his home office, and, but maybe his home office he only visits once every two or three weeks. All right. The other thing is, is these field service engineers, you know, um, their job isn't to install software. All right. Their job is to get the machine up and running. In other words, the person that's looking over their shoulder, yelling at them, telling them they need this to be fixed, isn't saying, you know, do you have the right version of the software installed? No. He's like, when is it going to be fixed and going to be working? They don't care what version of software they have installed. You know, they want it up and working. So it wasn't necessarily field service engineers' first priority to install this software. Now, the frustrating thing for us in our department is, Hey, we weren't perfect. We produced software with bugs. We did our best job to fix those bugs and to create a release and send it. But guess what? Do the logistics involved, um, getting that bug fix out there to the rest of the world, in this case, literally the rest of the world, um, was, a, was a mammoth task. And therefore, we'd get bug reports sent in long after we fixed it simply because the field service engineer wasn't able to uh, address the, the new issue and the new deployment. All right. So in that case, when you talk about thousands of people geographically spread, um, to get them a new app is a chore, All right, is a task. Now, that's sort of a very extreme case, but even in less extreme cases, you know, how difficult is it to get that application out there? If Google Docs, for example, upgrades their software tonight, everyone in the world that uses Google Docs gets that update at the same time. So an issue that existed in the old version just ain't going to exist anymore because no one's going to be running that version of the software. Unlike my situation where you release a, uh, 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 an update and uh, two weeks after the fact, there could be a substantial percentage of people that are still running older versions of the software. All right. So deployment, absolutely. Deployment is a breeze in this scenario. What's the general term for where your applications aren't on your, she aren't on your machine, but instead reside somewhere else on a server somewhere? What do they call that? Sort of the buzzword for that. It's dark now, but if you stuck your head out the window earlier today, yes, yeah, cloud computing, all right? And the idea of this is, which I probably should have trademarked when I first started drawing the diagram that looked like this, is, you know, oftentimes in my diagrams I draw the internet as a cloud, which sort of means I'm not really sure what's going on in there, I, but I know it works, right? It, you know, it gets sent up to the cloud. That's what they mean. In other words, when I go and, and store my file, you know, on my local machine, I can say, here's the USB drive, this is what it's stored on. When I go and store something in the cloud, 
I don't really know where it's stored physically, right? It's stored on one of Google's servers that is somewhere in the world, <laughs> all right? And th that, I suppose, is both the advantage of that and the downfall of that, right? Depending on your perspective is, is you know, for sensitive things, that's kind of disconcerting to say, well, it's out there and I can get to it. But then again, so can other people. Yet, you don't have to worry about backups, right? You don't have to worry about getting a newer version of the software. You don't have to pay for disk space. So a lot of advantages to it as well. Other advantages or disadvantages to, to either of these approaches that you can think of. We saw security that works both ways, all right? Not that one is superior than the other, but they both have different security issues. We said deployment is easier if it's only deployed on the server. Other issues. Yes. Um, yeah, um, th there's, you know, in, in, how do I want to say this? The ease in deployment does translate into lesser cost regardless of the, of the context. It just kind of translates in a different way. For example, if you're talking about Google Docs versus Microsoft, you know, Google Docs is a free program. So yeah, it's cheaper. It's cheaper in that respect. If you go back to my field service engineer example, all right, um, there's a substantial savings in terms of person power that we don't have to devote to burning CDs, mailing CDs, or FedExing CDs, or whatever, to all these different places. So in that regard, <laughs> you know, deploying it is you know, me or someone else dragging and dropping it on, uh, on there as opposed to sending, uh, you know, sending out 500 CDs uh, throughout the world. So yeah, uh, there, there's a little bit different way in which the lower cost manifests itself, but in both cases I would say, yeah, the, the cost of deployment is cheaper, definitely, because it's so much easier. Other issues? Yes? Yeah, you need the internet, right? What happens if you're not connected to the internet, all right? One of these two people, or network or whatever, one of these two people can do their jobs. <laughs> if you're disconnected to the internet, the other one can't, right? And that's a, that's, a, that's a vulnerability. So this requires a connection to the server. No, I didn't because I'm going to write does not. <laughs> yes, I did put that in the wrong column. Does not require a connection to server. One other thing that I, I alluded to, but we might as well uh, formalize, is that this will typically require a... a for lack of a better word, a beefier client. Right. Okay. That's actually a slightly different point than I made, and it's another excellent point. And, and the point I made is typically, you know, the, the client deployment requires a, a more client resources, so therefore it requires a beefier machine, a stronger, faster, bigger, whatever machine. You made the good point of compatibility issues between clients, and that's a great point as well, because forgetting about the power of the machine, um, it, depending, again, on the organization, someone runs a Mac versus a PC. Someone runs a, uh, a um, 
you know, a, a Windows uh, 7 or is still running XP or whatever, all right, there's a risk of compatibility issues that you have because the client is actually running the code. Um, with the uh, other option, there's really no compatibility issues other than making sure that you have the right browser, making sure that you have adequate browsing capability. And a connection, and a connection. right, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and it's funny, it's like I tell folks, you know, when you consider something like this and you consider the alternatives, there's always going to be like advantages and disadvantages. Because if there wasn't, there wouldn't be an alternative, right? If every single thing pointed to one way or the other as being the better way, then everyone in the world would do it that way, right? And we wouldn't even be having this discussion. Now, the interesting thing is, is this issue, this very issue, in my mind, is huge now with respect to the mobile market, all right? Because what do you do if you want to develop something for a mobile device? Well, what are your choices? You can make a web application that people will go and access your website and do all the things that they want to do, or you can write an app. What's the problem of writing an app? The problem of writing an app is an iPhone app won't work on an Android phone, an Android phone won't work on a, uh, or an Android app won't work on, a, on an iPhone. And what's worse than that, depending on the version of Android you have, it might not work and so on. Yes? On the Mac, yeah. Yeah, depending on, depending if you want to take a, uh, how do I want to say, take a cynical view or take another view, you could say, you could say a couple things. One thing would be, that the cynical view would be, well, th they want to restrict, th they, they, want, they want complete control over how they do things and, and therefore they don't want they don't want anything that's kind of open. They want to have completely proprietary stuff and very closed because that gives them control. That's sort of the cynical thing, a cynical way to look at it. The, the more generous way to look at it is saying, okay, that's kind of true, but that's why Macs are so easy to use. That's why Macs, um, you know, uh, work very seamlessly. That's why Max, you don't have to worry about dragging and dropping your music onto, onto your thing. You plug it in and it syncs up. If you control every aspect of a process, the hardware, the software, the, the infrastructure, operating system and all that, then you can, you can be pretty darn sure it works. You know? There's like, how many different variations of Max can you buy today? You know, there's three or four, if we're talking about the machines, there's three or four configurations. How many versions are mobile devices? Well, there, again, there's a handful, right? How many variations are there of Android phones? A lot of them. How many variations of PCs are there? When you start talking about the graphic cards they have and the prior, you know, there's a lot of them. So their argument would be, yeah, we make this closed environment that we have control over and that allows us to give more seamless services. The, the more cynical side is, yeah, they do that to, to, to have, uh, in essence, uh, kind of a little monopoly going on, you know, and, and they're mono they, they want to monopolize and in, in, in doing that to, to, the, to, the, uh, um, uh, to the detriment of any potential competition. All right. A lot easier syncing than Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, you know, you got to you got to think of who the typical user is and and who uh, who uh, you know who is using it and and who are they marketing to? You know, they're they're marketing to people that you know that don't want to spend a lot of time on that. And again, sometimes software developers look down and say, "Oh, the dumb user." This and it's like, no, that's not a case. The, the the quote dumb user isn't dumb. They just want to do what they want to do. They don't want to spend their time tinkering with hardware and software. Right? They want to plug it in and they want it to work. You know, and that's their perspective. Now, people that are more proficient maybe have a different view of those things. For example, I love the fact that uh, the Android devices, if I want to, I pop them into a USB port and it works just like a USB drive. So if there's something I don't have an app for and I want to figure it out, I'll just drag the stuff over there, you know. I don't, I don't worry about an app to sync things up or whatever, you know, um, to, to 
create a PDF on your iPhone, you got to do this, this, this. And I just open it up and drag it over, you know. And, and uh, again, I like the openness and, and the fact that you can, if you want to, dig your, dig your hands in and, and, and get, your, get your hands dirty. But most people don't, yes. Again, what kind of users are we talking about? Yeah, I, I would argue your typical user would uh, would would typically want to steer clear from that because they're, they're you know it, you know it, it's like me cracking open the engine of my car and doing something. I know better than to do that, right? Uh, and, and again, I think a lot of people would be concerned for that. Not to mention that that probably voids their warranty. Uh, strictly speaking, is illegal, uh, and so on and so forth. So even forgetting about the ethical thing. Uh, I think the typical uh, Apple demographic it, graphic is people that don't want to mess with that kind of stuff. If they want to mess with that kind of stuff, I don't know, they'd be using a Linux phone or something, right? So uh, again, I, I don't want to minimize that. that. That's possible, but that's not that's not the auth the Apple authorized usage of it. So that really, you know, I, I still stand by the comments I said as far as what Apple's philosophy is and why they choose to do things that way. All right, we'll see you up in lab. Next time, by the way, we'll actually dig into the details of these different things. We'll, we'll talk about creating the jars and, and that sort of stuff.